Welcome to Handgun Ammunition. In this short video, we're going to be discussing the performance of handgun ammunition. We're going to be going over the four parts of the cartridge, rimfire versus centerfire, the firing sequence of a cartridge, all the different bullet styles, caliber confusion, how to make sure that you're matching the correct ammo to your handgun, and three types of ammunition malfunctions. The four parts of the cartridge are the primer, which is a compound when compressed creates a spark. This picture is showing you a center fire primer. Next is the powder. The powder burns rapidly creating a hot high pressure gas that pushes the bullet down the bore. Then you have the case. The casing is the outside of the cartridge that holds it all together. And then you have the bullet. The bullet is the projectile that exits the muzzle. Those are the four parts of a cartridge. There are two types of primer. There's rim fire versus center fire. Commonly used in the 22 caliber is the rim fire. The priming compound is in the case rim. These casings are damaged after the firing pin strikes them and therefore may not be reloaded. However, you can recycle the brass. The center fire is more reliable than the rim fire and is used in personal defense firearms. These casings may be used to reload simply by replacing the primer, the powder, and the bullet and pressing them in a reloading press. There is no federal oversight for reloading, so we highly recommend that you use manufactured ammunition in your personal defense firearm. The firing sequence of any cartridge goes as follows. The firing pin strikes the primer. The primer is compressed causing a spark. The spark ignites the powder which burns rapidly creating a hot high pressure volume of gas which then pushes the bullet down the bore. The loud bang is when the gas exits the muzzle. The sound is 112 decibels at the muzzle. There are lots of different bullet styles to consider. From left to right, we have the lead wad cutter. You can imagine with this flat top that it would not travel very well through the air. It would end up tumbling a lot quicker than perhaps this lead round nose. Also, a lead wad cutter is not going to cycle very well in a semi-automatic, so it would be yes, best used in a revolver. Next you have a lead semi wad cutter, and then we start getting into the jackets. Lead is really soft, and so upon impact disintegrates quite easily. Lead bullets are best used when shooting steel, or animals that you don't intend to eat, because the lead can be distributed throughout the meat and you could end up ingesting some lead. The jacket is made of copper. Copper is slightly harder than lead which holds the integrity of the bullet a little bit better upon impact. As you look at these bullets I want you to think about how they would travel through the air. Remember that the rifling puts a slight twist or spin on them which stabilizes the bullet when it exits the muzzle. Next we start out with a hollow point so this is a semi-jacketed hollow point. A hollow point has a void in the center, which upon impact spreads out, mushrooms out, creating a larger surface area that then slows the bullet down because of the friction, and hopefully the bullet will stay inside and not come through the body. They should expand at least half the distance of the width please look at our YouTube channel playlist under Ballistics Performance for fantastic information on ballistics performance as it hits ballistic gel. Ballistic gel is support, supposed to be um, the same consistency as a body. So take the time and subscribe to our YouTube channel and learn a lot more about the ballistics and terminal performance of your hollow points. A full metal jacket is fully encased in copper. This particular bullet 
travels through a lot of substrates. It will go through eight layers of sheetrock. That's four walls in your home. It could go in a car door, possibly through somebody, and possibly out the other car door. This is not what you want to carry in your personal defense firearm in public or even in your home if you live in close, close quarters of neighbors, apartments, or children in the next room. This would be best used at the gun range for paper targets. Next you have a jacketed truncated cone. And then we end up with the jacketed hollow point. The jacketed hollow point is going to be hold together longer and be able to penetrate more because of the full jacket hollow point versus the soft lead nose hollow point. Hollow points are generally deeply creased to degradate the integrity of the wall of the hollow point so that it expands quicker. When you have a full jacketed hollow point, that degradation is less, and so these are going to expand slower, meaning that the penetration can be a lot deeper, uh, 12 to 18 inches at least. Um, these are commonly used by law enforcement because they are the most um, likely to have to be shooting through twigs, branches, um, walls, furniture, things like that. There's also, not on this list, is snake shot. So for the semi-automatic, the snake shot dome is a, is a clear blue dome that you can see through that's rounded like this that you can um, have, it has lots of little snake shot in here that you can see on a revolver, the blue dome is squared off much like this lead wad cutter. But snake shot is a great um, alternative but just know that that blue casing makes quite a hole in the target. So don't think that it's less lethal. But it is good for snakes or coyotes or dogs or things like that. There are rubber bullets. Rubber bullets can penetrate at least two inches into the body. So if people think that a rubber bullet is less lethal, they're wrong. It depends on shot placement. And frangible uh, is a polymer. And frangible ammunition is thought to not go through a sofa or even some uh, dense clothing such as uh, winter clothing, vests, leather jackets, things like that, but it does. So polymer is something that you might consider carrying in your personal d defense firearm if you're going to be going into a city or parking garage or things like that where there's a lot of ricochet issues. The most common handgun caliber ammunition are as follows. You have 22 long rifle. 22 long rifle or 22 LR can be used in a handgun. You have 22 shorts. The casing is much shorter than a long rifle. And then you have 22 magnum. Anytime you see the word magnum, it just means that the casing is longer, therefore holding more powder. So the pressure would be greater and the recoil would be greater. Then you have your 38 special. That's a revolver. And there's 38 plus P or 38 plus P plus. So plus P means that there's plus powder or plus pressure added to that cartridge. If your firearm does not say plus P on the frame of the barrel, then it is not engineered to handle the pressure released from the firing sequence of a plus P cartridge. It will chamber but over time can leave microscopic fractures in your barrel, which could lead to a catastrophic failure of that barrel upon firing. This is one of the reasons why I never buy a used handgun from somebody that I don't trust, because a lot of people will shoot plus P down a barrel that's not engineered for the plus P. And you can find the plus P designation on your frame, your barrel, on the head stamp of the cartridge, and on your ammo box, but please read your manual. The 380, 380 is the semi-automatic version of the 38. The ammunition can also be made to say this on the box, 9 by 17. 0.38 inches is equivalent to 9 millimeter. However, the 380 auto 9 millimeter is quite a bit shorter than a true 9mm, which is 9 by 19. So if you put them both next to each other, you would see that the 9 by 17 is much shorter, 2 centimeters, or 2 millimeters, 
uh, shorter than the 9x19. So if you do choose a 380 auto, just buy good American ammunition that says 380 on the box. There's a common Russian brand called Kurz, capital K-U-R-Z, and it does say 9mm on the outside. So a 9x17 will chamber in a 9mm, however, the possibility of getting a squib load is very, very high because the casing and the cartridge is so much shorter that it backs that bullet back up into the chamber, allowing a little bit of room upon ignition can become sideways in your bore. So just make sure that you double check this. The 9x17 is shorter than the 9x19. The 357 Magnum double action revolver is one of the most versatile revolvers out there. It can shoot 357 Magnum, it can shoot 38 Special, it can shoot 38 Plus P and 38 Plus P Plus. Also, it can shoot 38 lights. L-I-T-E, Hornady makes a light load for all semi-automatic and revolver cartridge ammunition. It just means that it's loaded to less than normal pressure or powder, and they lighten the grain weight of the bullet as well to help in its ballistics and terminal performance. So then we get into the 9mm, which is a 9x19. The 9mm, the 9x17 aka 380, will chamber in your 9x19, however, may cause a squib load. The 45 auto is also a common handgun caliber. 45 auto and 45 ACP will both work in a 45 semi automatic. ACP stands for automatic cold pistol. There's three areas to check your caliber on your frame or your barrel, on your box of ammo, and on your head stamp. But always read your manual before you shoot your firearm. Cartridge malfunctions. A misfire is a failure of a cartridge to ignite when the primer or the case rim has been struck by the firing pin. This may be caused by a defect in the cartridge or a defect in the pistol causing a weak firing pin. A hang fire is a perceptible delay in the ignition of a cartridge after the primer or case rim have been struck by the firing pin. This delay may last several seconds. When a cartridge fails to fire immediately, it will not be known at first if the problem is a misfire or a hang fire. Therefore, keep a strong grip with that firearm pointed in a safe direction and count to 30 before attempting to clear the firearm. A squib load occurs when the cartridge develops less than normal pressure or velocity after ignition of the cartridge. Squib loads can cause the bullet to fail to exit the muzzle and become loaded or lodged in the bore. So in a revolver, if you have a hang fire and you press the trigger and it goes click and you're in a gunfight and you go ahead and press the trigger again, that hang fire then rotates to the next area, bringing the new cartridge in line with the firing pin and the bore. And if it is a hang fire and it does go off, that's a huge problem. But at that point, in a life or death situation, you don't have a choice. If you have a semi-automatic and you're in a gunfight and you press the trigger and nothing happens, you want to tap, rack, and bang, which means you're going to take the palm of your support hand and slap the bottom of that magazine as firmly as possible, making sure that it is seated. And then you're going to rack your slide which will take the malfunction cartridge out of the handgun and put it on the ground or wherever. And we'll, when the slide comes forward, it will feed a fresh cartridge in and then bang, tap, rack, bang. If that is a hang fire on the ground, um, there's nothing firmly holding it. So when it does go off, the bullet will go one way, the casing will go the other. And the worst that could happen is, you know, you get struck by that. But again, your options are in a gunfight for your life, that's what you would do, tap, rack, and bang. I hope you've enjoyed this series on handgun ammunition. Please watch the videos. Please download this PDF for future reference, and I'll see you in the next module.